Good afternoon or good evening social media or good morning whenever you find this video. I had some technical difficulties with my audio so it wasn't very far into the the video I had to restart my camera here to make sure that it's working properly. So if anybody chimes in and everything looks good please let me know about it okay. Um, this is a little bit of a an important topic that I want to discuss for a few minutes and I was listening to one of uh, my YouTube followers, uh, Chad Thomas, on YouTube, which is Watchman on the Wall 88, and he gave us a quick update on the whole climate, uh, climate COP27 conference today. Now, there's other ministries that are talking about this, of course, okay? And in the title tonight, I'm imploring people that are not Christians or not even believers in God or maybe you believe in something weird, you know, I don't know what it would be, but don't laugh this off if you read the title because it is going to affect everybody's life. And the reason why, this is the reason why I'm talking about it tonight, okay? Um, Jordan, that's absolutely right. Can you guys hear me okay, by the way? I hope so. Um, I restarted my camera here, so hopefully we're good to go. And uh, I wanna give you a correlation of what happened in the Old Testament with Egypt, okay? It's no, mis it's no mistake or no accident that these climate change people went to um, Egypt and climbed this mountain that they call uh, Mount Sinai, which is not the real Mount Sinai. And that's not even the most important issue of the day, that it's, that it's the authentic mountain or not. But They've held that tradition in Egypt and around the world for a long time that they believe this is the Mount Sinai, that Moses went up and received the Ten Commandments from God. But uh, back in like the mid to late 90s, there was an archaeologist, in fact, I think his ministry is still going right now, Bob Cornuk, discovered the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. He's the guy that did it, okay? At least made it known to the Western world, let's put it that way. And uh, Galatians 4.25 says that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Uh, go read that. But like I say, this is not the most important issue of the day about the location of Mount Sinai. A lot of people are talking about it, but it's, it's what these people are doing um, and their symbolism and that they're climbing this mountain that they call Mount Sinai and they're grabbing 10 climate commandments. All right. Well, listen, there's some very rich and powerful, influential people that are involved in this. OK, it's it's what the Bible would call the kings of the earth, um, presidents, prime ministers, rich people that are influencing this whole thing. And those are the people that are controlling a lot of what's happening around the world and have been for a while now. And if you don't think for one second that that people are not going to fall in line with their 10 climate change commandments, just look at the last uh, few years that we went through. We went through this whole sickness thing and forcing everybody to wear a mask and everybody was complying pretty much. Okay, look at our elections. Nobody's protesting the uh, shadiness of these elections that we just had in November. People just... They're, they're numb to, to a, lot of, um, a lot of what's happening in the world today. That's the way I want to put it, okay? And whether people stand up or not, but I'm just saying that these 10 climate change commandments are going to be implemented. King Charles, who was Prince Charles, said uh, a year ago that they were going to fund, um, let's just say that in their conference of the uh, G20 summit, whatever that was that they had a year ago, um, they're going to finance this whole thing for climate change and they need one ruler under it and that ruler needs trillions of dollars plus a military to enforce it. That's where this is going after today. Now, let me read this to you. Um, if some of you don't know about this and then we're gonna go to the scriptures, okay? First of all, let me start with a scripture. Let me do that. Ecclesi and my group knows about this scripture. It's one of my favorite ones because it's so relevant, okay? Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. The thing that hath been, 
is that which shall be, and that which is done, and that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. This is King James, okay? Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It hath already of old time, which was done before us. So this, this conference in Egypt, right, is nothing new under the sun. It's not, God is saying to all of us, like, all, what's happened in the past will happen again. There's nothing new under the sun. Now, let me just, <laughs> this is going to be interesting, and I hope, Lord, to give me the right words here. I hope this comes out right tonight, because I'm on to something I want to show you. Brother Chad wrote this, and I'm going to give you the Ten Climate Commandments first, okay? In an open mockery to God, interfaith leaders from, from Jews, Muslims, Laodicean Christians, I want to call them Laodicean Christians, Hindus and Buddhists are taking it upon themselves by meeting at Mount Sinai in Egypt, okay, not the real one. Around the world today, Sunday, November 13th, 2022, to partake in a global climate repentance ceremony and implement a new age, one world religion of 10 new commandments. All right, let me read these, let me read these, these new commandments. Are you ready for this? All right, this is Satan mocking God, by the way. And you know, the Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Just remember that someday, okay? Just remember that. Here's the first commandment for climate change. We are stewards of this world. You know what? <clears throat> this is really, now listen, Satan himself is the one that constructed these Ten Commandments, all right? He put it in the people's minds to write it down. But what the Satan, uh, the snake, who was Satan came as a snake to, to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden because they were stewards of the Garden of Eden to tend it and take care of it, okay? That was the command that God gave Adam and Eve to take care of the garden and tend it, okay? So that sounds, oh, that sounds cool. We're stewards of this world, right? But you have to look at the underlining motive of why they're saying this. What's their motive for saying we're, we are stewards of this world? Because God told us so or because they have a different agenda? And I think it's because they have a different agenda. Let's keep reading. The second commandment, creation manifests divinity. <laughs> commandment three, everything in life is interconnected. Oh, yeah? Number four, do no harm. By the way, Pope Francis had, had a play in these commandments, just so that you understand, all right? Um, Mr. Architect of uh, Climate Change um, Commandments. Look after tomorrow. Rise, look at um, commandment number six. Rise above ego of our world. So in other words, that's, that's a direct message for us born-again Bible-believing Christians. We have an ego because we're we're loyal to the God of the Bible, right? And we're not um, inclusive. To, I mean, we're inclusive, so you know we're we're not go, we're not playing along with their their ideology. So, but we in in their commandments, we have to rise above our ego for the world. Okay, change our inner climate, inner climate. Okay, repent and return. You have to say sorry for for your sins of of ruining the earth and and hurting the climate. Okay. Number nine, every action matters. And number 10, use mind and open heart. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Those are the 10 commandments of the climate change people. Okay. Now let's go over to the real 10 commandments. Are you ready for this? Let's read the real 10 commandments. Um, number Commandment number one in the Bible. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no strange gods before me. Number two, thou shalt not take the Lord, the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I see that on TV. I hear people doing it all the time. I mean, I'm out in the country here. You can see the snow behind me. But I mean, when I'm in big inner cities, I hear that all the time. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Um, Linda, let me read Linda's comment, then I'm going to read commandment number four, okay? 
Linda says, my husband's been sick for four days. Sounds like he might have COVID. Uh, going to take him to Kaiser, uh, okay, for a COVID test. Nurse Linda has been taking care of him. Have to watch a replay. Okay, Linda, well, we're praying for you and your husband. Lord, be with Linda and her husband as they go to Kaiser and take care of this. And um, we prayed negative test results of COVID on her husband and that it's just a common flu. It is flu season right now, Linda. So uh, don't be anxious about whatever's going on there. Just take care of what you have to take care of. Lord willing and all to God's glory, he will take care of you in Jesus' name and your husband, okay? Commandment number four in the Bible, honor thy mother and thy father. Those of you who have reasons to hate your father and your mother, I understand, okay? There might be reasons that you hate them, but this is not a choice. If you fear God, if you love God, it's a choice to choose to obey his commandments it's, and honor your mother and father, okay? Even if they're not honorable. We have mothers and fathers in this world that are very honorable and it's easy to do, but there's other people that don't have honorable mothers and fathers. <clears throat> and just the way you honor your mother and your father is to don't curse them, don't speak out against them, and just try to zip your lip, even if they're doing bad things to you or if they're make, you know, making your life miserable. You pray for them. That's how you honor your mother and father, okay? Commandment number five, thou shalt not steal. I'm sorry, I take that back. Thou shalt not kill. In other words, commit murder. Thou shalt not commit murder. Don't take the life of somebody else, okay? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Number seven, thou shalt not steal. That's the one that I messed up on. Commandment number seven, God says, thou shalt not steal. Commandment number eight, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. Okay. Why did he say against your neighbor? You know, because um, your neighbor is relying on you and trusting on you to not take advantage of them uh, because you live next door to them. Okay. So we have to watch out for each other. Commandment number 10, thou shalt not cover, covet thy neighbor's goods. All right. Those are the 10 real commandments. Now, I want to show you something. You're welcome, Sister Linda, no problem. I want to show you something that's really, really interesting to me about this whole climate agenda thing. I am seeing a pattern here in the climate agenda that I didn't really pay attention to before, but I'm starting to see it now, is that the climate agenda of the people today are motivated by the same false gods that the Egyptians were serving during the time of Moses. And this is what's fascinating to me because, because I started looking at um, um, the gods that the Egyptians served during the time of Moses, okay? And it's, it's, all, it's all the same thing, very close, very, very similar to the same thing that these people that are worshiping the, the climate and Mother Earth are doing right now, they're guilty of. And so I wanna reel off a couple of these to you so that you can see a correlation. It's really interesting to me. And why did God send 10 plagues um, to Egypt? To, to, uh, because Pharaoh had, had the Hebrews were pris his prisoners, okay? But God sent 10 plagues on Egypt and then finally Pharaoh set them free after the 10th plague. This is really interesting. The God of Israel is greater than all the, all the other Egyptian gods and the goddesses, okay? Let me read this to you really fast. It's from an article. If you want the article, I will drop the article in, but this is some of my research notes. Um, okay. The first God that the Egyptians had was, is called Hapi, H-A-P-I, the Egyptian God of the Nile. And the Egyptian God was a water bearer, okay? So what was the first thing that God did, or the first plague that God sent to, to the Egyptians? He turned the water into blood. The first, uh, the first plague that was given to the Egyptians from God was that of turning the water into blood, okay? The second plague um, was to rebuke this, this goddess that they had called Hekit, H-E-K-E-T. These are Egyptian, they're demons, actually, fallen angels. Let's just put it like it is, okay? But, I mean, back then, 
they were serving these gods with a small g. There's only one god. There's no multiple gods. Mormons are wrong. They get A lot of people get it all wrong. We are not gods. We are created beings, ladies and gentlemen. So don't let people lie to you that have been lied to by some uh, evil spirit that, that we're gods. We're not gods. There's only one God out there, okay? The creator of the universe, God, the Jehovah God, um, Emmanuel God with us, okay? Um, so, Heket, H-E-K-E-T, the Egyptian goddess of fertility, water renewal. Um, and so, the Egyptian, uh, this was the, the, this God, this God that they served had the uh, head of the frog, okay? The God of fertility. Fertility is a um, it's a feminine type of uh, of God. Okay, so this is where we we get the whole. Um, how do I want to say this without getting censored? <laughs> um, the Sodom and Gomorrah movement. Okay, if you know what I'm talking about, uh, this is where this God comes from. The Egyptian plague of frogs. It was a, it was a, the head of a frog that they used as its God. So what did God do? He sent frogs to Egypt and overrun them with frogs. Okay, so he was rebuking that god, Heket. Here's the next plague. This was plague number three. Interesting that there's ten plagues, ten commandments from God, and ten climate commandments. Isn't that interesting, that number ten? This next one is called uh, Geb, G-E-B. The Egyptian god of the earth. All right, and uh, this is really interesting. This was of the dust of the earth. This is what the Egyptians worshipped, the dust of the earth. So what did God send uh, to Egypt as a third plague? He sent them lice from the dust of the earth. So lice plagued uh, Pharaoh and his uh, officials, not in the land of Goshen, by the way. The Hebrews were protected from all of these plagues. But this is the, set, this is the third plague that God sent onto them, was the... Uh, was the, the lice, okay? Because that was the one that they were serving, G-E-B, Geb, okay? Now this one, um, this next, this fourth plague, the Egyptian god was called Kerpri, Kerpri, K-H-E-R-P-R-I, E-P-R-I, Kerpri, the Egyptian god of creation, movement of the sun, rebirth, okay? And the head of this god was a fly. So what did God do to rebuke that one? To rebuke that false god? He sent them a plague of flies. Okay. These, now look at this. I, I, I really want, you know, I'm going to, what I want to do, here's what I'm going to do. <clears throat> I'm going to send this to you guys in the chat, chat box down below. <clears throat> Give me one second. This is so close to climate change to me, what these people are worshiping today. That is just uncanny to me that, that this is the same movement that the Egyptians had and were serving in their time when God sent the ten plagues on them. Okay? This is why what I'm telling you, what they're doing, what they have done up to this point is getting God's, it will get God's attention. You know, I'm just telling you for sure. Um, thank you, Ter uh, Sister Terry, for sharing. Anybody else that wants to share this tonight, uh, please do so if you feel like you want to do it. If not, it's okay. Like I say, these will always go out where they're supposed to go. Uh, the goal tonight is to just show you some similarities between the Egyptian gods of Moses' time and the climate change people, um, their habits and their motives and who they're serving today. Okay, it's, it's very uncanny. It's almost the same thing. So... That fourth one, here comes the fifth one. The fifth Egyptian god that the Egyptians served was called Hathor. And this, this Egyptian goddess was depicted from the head of a cow. So what did God do to rebuke that false god? He sent the plague of death to all the cattle and the livestock. The sixth one was, <laughs> this is crazy, Isis. <laughs> this was an Egyptian goddess of medicine and peace. So here's what God did to rebuke that one. God sent ashes turned into boils and sores. Ooh, okay. He rebuked that goddess to send the Egyptians boils and sores. So what do you what do you think is happening with these climate change people? What do you think is in store for them, ladies and gentlemen? 
are you angry about it? Or are you, you know, you'd like, okay, you guys are setting yourself up for some judgments. This is exactly what the way I see that they're, they're setting themselves up for judgments and they don't even know it. Um, yeah, Jordan, and this is the reason why I'm going over these false gods of Egypt in Moses' time is because they're very similar to these climate change people. And they're mocking God by doing, going up this fake, it's not even the real Mount Sinai, but they're going up there and they're implementing these 10 climate commandments that they're going to put on the whole world. That's their goal, ladies and gentlemen. And right now the devil's helping them get that done. And God's going to oblige them because of man's disobedience to scripture, to his command, his real commandments, and for rejecting his son, Jesus Christ. This is what they're going to get. The, the, and, you know, our job, ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, is to warn people. And that's what we do. And sometimes the warnings are not well received. They're received with scorn, rebuke, uh, mockery. And all that. But I can guarantee you one thing. As soon as the pre-tribulation of the rapture happens, they won't be laughing and mocking anymore. Uh, the same with the, the, the day that the flood came when they were laughing at Noah for building an ark and mocking him. And he was warning that, that generation as well. And nobody listened. Nobody listened to Noah either. And then they weren't laughing anymore. As soon as the, the earthquakes around the world started happening and the foundations... Listen, the foundations of the earth can't open up without an earthquake, okay, without earthquakes. But it didn't just rain on the earth, but the foundations of the earth were opened up and all the water came up from under the earth to flood everybody. So it was earthquakes that caused that to open up and then the rain came down and people stopped laughing after that. They're going to stop laughing someday, at least people that were warned. You know, they won't be laughing because we'll be gone and they're going to have to deal with all of these things. Uh, good evening, Rebecca. Nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. I'm going over the, 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 the 10 false gods of Egypt, Rebecca, in the Old Testament, who the Egyptians were serving and showing some similarities between this and the climate change people that just climbed the, the fake Mount Sinai in Egypt. Um, well, I want to say probably yesterday, I guess, because it's evening time here and there's a different time zone over there. But they just finished doing it. And they didn't do it, they did it as symbolism, but also they have an agenda behind it. And it's to implement their, their laws, their rules for the world. And Antichrist is going to be in charge of that someday. He's going to be the one that takes the reins on this thing. Okay, but he, the devil is setting everybody up. Even, even the people that are serving him knowingly or not knowingly, he is setting them up. And believe me, the devil knows the rapture is coming. That's why you see all of these manifestations of strange lights in the sky and, and airline pilots reporting strange sights in the sky and, you know, like UFO activity and things like that. Because those are from the dark side, ladies and gentlemen. Ephesians chapter 6, principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. These people are um, believing a lie, okay, like it's UFOs, but it's not. It's 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 Satan's kingdom that are, are deceiving man because when the rapture happens, there will be some people that believe that UFOs took people off of the earth or, you know, and if you think I'm crazy, like if you think that when this moment actually happens that they won't come up with reasons why, they're not actually going to say it was Jesus. You know, some people will know that Jesus came and took his church, but there's going to be other people that try to explain it away through their own false religions or their phone, their own vision of what they think is right in their own mind. Okay. Something like that. Um, Jordan, you know, I, I hope so too. I hope the rapture is very soon. And I've, I've had conflicting thoughts about that for myself because I know hands down for a fact, I'm a rational person. I'm trying, I try not to be a, a clickbait fear-mongering type of Christian or anything like that that tries to get people to watch my videos. Because I sit and I reason with myself about when the rapture is going to happen, you know? And as a student of the Bible, I look at it like this. Everything that the Bible has said would be happening in the generation to, that would see the Lord's return is happening right now. There's all kinds of proof of that in the scriptures and what's playing out in the world that I know we're, we're in the season of the rapture. I can't control or keep asking God or keep bothering him about it. Hurry up and come and get us, you know? Like, I'd like to tell him that. 
you know, like, because it says to give him no rest in the Bible until he makes Jerusalem the glory of the whole earth. Well, the Jerusalem can't be the glory of the whole earth with Jesus sitting there until the rapture happens first, and then the seven-year tribulation, and then the second coming. So I like to remind him about that, but at the same time, I look at this life as an opportunity in a very unique generation to finish my race, as opposed to other generations like my parents, my grandparents, and people before them that lived in different times and different seasons, you know. Uh, but we're in a very unique generation, and I look at it as like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to take advantage of whatever I can. Um, to warn people to try to live with integrity, to try to live as sin-free as I can, but that's impossible. I know it is. I'm a sinner just like everybody else. But there is a judgment seat of Christ that's coming for believers. So when the rapture does happen, I'm going to be evaluated and everything is going to be laid bare before God. And it's going to go through the fire. And my life is going to be sifted. You know, when I was a kid, my dad used to take me gold panning in the desert in Arizona. And we would sift through the dirt and we would find the gold in the dirt, you know. And we would pluck those little gold flakes out and sometimes there'd be a little nugget. That's the way our life is going to be sifted. And it's going to be like a, I think it's going to be like a flash, you know, and it'll be done and we're going to know what we get when, when it's finished being filtered, you know, and, and those are, we'll be received crowns. We're going to receive the crown of life, you know, the crown of righteousness, the, the crown, um, the crown of righteousness is the one for the hope of his coming. And there's other crowns. There's a martyr's crown, which I'll take a pass on that one unless I'm forced into it. I'm not going to lie to people about that. If I have to be martyred for my faith, I'm not going to deny, deny Jesus Christ and he'll give me the strength for that moment if that happens to me someday. I am a firm believer that God will look after his own until the rapture of the church. So there's a lot of Christians that think that we're going to suffer lots of persecution before. I'm going to finish the, these commandments, or I'm sorry, these fake gods in a second. But there's a lot of people that think we're going to suffer persecution before the rapture of the church. Now, there's no doubt that people have suffered persecution for 2,000 years. All the way, ever since Jesus ascended to heaven and the early church was persecuted probably the worst. Okay? But there's there's been martyrs, there's been persecution. But I want to tell you this that I know is an absolute biblical promise. God will not allow his bride to be crushed. He is not going to allow his bride to be crushed. If you would forget everything else that I say tonight, just remember that. If you're living in this generation as a born-again Christian and you're all stressed out and you've got anxiety about, oh, what's going to happen to me? Are they going to come to my door and whisk me away or interrogate? Look, you know, there is a small T tribulation that we all have to endure in this life, okay? It's not a bed of roses all the time. But I guarantee you, God will not allow, Jesus Christ will not allow his bride to be crushed before God's wrath can come on the earth. He's going to remove his people off of the earth before the wrath begins. Make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, the wrath of God is meant for unbeliever. it's, unbelievers. It's not meant for his, his, his bride, okay? I want people to understand that. Jordan says, I wished for that all my life. Um, Sin-free was easier as a child. To me anyway, I think God already knows what, who is going? I I get, um, I get the one for hope. Can't wait to give it to him. Well, we're gonna get at least one crown when we get there, Jordan. And you know, because we believed in Jesus Christ and we had a born again experience and we had our sins washed away. It's so easy, and I want to share that. So, I want to share the gospel, but let me get finished with this real fast. Make no mistake about it. God will not allow his bride to be crushed. The rapture of the church is going to happen in this generation. I would love to be able to tell you when, but I don't know. And I'm not going to pretend to know. And I'm not going to give anybody a false hope and tell you, oh, I think something's going to happen tomorrow or this year. Or, don't know. But we'll know when it's near at the very door. We will know it's near at the very door because catastrophic things will keep happening on the earth. In other words... Uh, Jesus compared it to labor pains, not just for the time after the rapture of the church, but the season of Israel, the season of the fig tree. And the baby was born, so to speak, in the labor pains in 1948 when Israel was reborn.
That's when the labor pains are going to begin. That's when the baby was conceived, as so to speak, spiritually speaking. And we have to go through this generation of labor pains. And the labor pains before the baby is born, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ, um, has to get more intense. So that's why I'm, I'm telling you as a student, okay, we are that generation. We are the fig tree generation, which will see Jesus come. But we have to see the labor pains get more intense. And as they get more intense, the more intense it gets, the more happy you should be because it's, it's going to mean we're out of here really soon. Uh, Terry asks, how, how, um, how, to, how do we get crowns in, for heaven? I need to have a Bible study on that, Terry, but it's easier than people think. Uh, and let me, let me explain it like this, and then I'll finish off these, um, these last five false gods of Egypt. Is that uh, you don't need to be a superstar. You don't need to be um, some big evangel evangelist preacher or, uh, you know, God could call you to do great things, but all he calls us all to be is faithful. He just calls us to be faithful for wherever he has us. Faithful for what? That's between you and God. He will show you. And all you have to do for, to get those crowns in heaven is to be faithful. Okay, now there's certain crowns, like I mentioned about the martyr's crown. Um, you know, <laughs> I would take a pass on that one, but if I have to endure that, I will. But I'm not, I, that, you know, but there's crowns that we're all eligible for. In other words, um, let's just say this. I love this crown. <clears throat> this is the crown of righteousness, the one for the hope of his coming. There's people that don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. There's people that are not looking for the, for his, the hope of his coming. Titus 2.13 says, we are looking for the hope of his coming. So there's people that are not looking for it. And there's Christians that are not looking for it because they're content with their life. They love their kids. They love their grandkids. They love their life more, you know, and I'm not questioning their love for God or anything like that, but, but they, they will like, they like things the way they are for themselves. The ones who are going to be eligible for the crown of righteousness are the ones that are, they're paying attention to what's going on around the world for one. And number two, they're like, Lord, I, I'm going to be happy when you come. I want to go. I, I'm ready. I'm on ghost standby. I'm waiting for you to come. I'm, I'm happy when you come. I'm going to be so glad to see you. I'm going to be so glad to see my relative. Those are the people who are going to get the crown of righteousness. So there's one crown right there. Okay. There's that one. I think there's a crown for, um, for, for, for teachers. And there's, there's, there's other, you know, there, there's, there's debates about how many crowns there actually are. I think there's like five standard crowns, but then there's, there's people that talk about other crowns. And, um, who is that guy? Oh my goodness. Robert Breaker. Uh, Jordan, uh, not Jordan, it's Terry. Terry, go on YouTube and type in Robert Breaker, uh, crowns in heaven. Okay. And he, he does an exhaustive Bible study almost about all the crowns that we can be eligible for in heaven. He does a fantastic job of it. So I would love for you to go on there and check him out. Um, I can even do a Bible study on that someday. I can put some Bible study notes together and we can, uh, yes, the soul winner's crown, Jordan. Thank you very much. The soul winner's crown. We don't win souls to God, but what we do is we plant seeds. So we're seed planters. And God changes the heart of, of man, okay? So what we do is we give them scriptures you can do that by getting gospel tracts and just putting them in the windshield of a car or putting them in a, in a, in a cooler case at the grocery store or wherever you feel led to do so. And I'm, you know, like somebody jumped on me one time for like putting them in mailboxes. Like, oh, that's a federal, federal offense. I'm like, yeah, give, give me a break. I get spam mail in my mailbox all the time. <laughs> all right. So let's get back on this. I got to finish this off because I got to do the, go I got to give the gospel. Okay. Um, Okay, so let's go to this next god. It's, this god is called Nut, N-U-T, the Egyptian goddess of the sky. Egyptian plague ha and hail rain down from uh, in the form of fire, okay? So the Egyptian god of the sky. Now look, we're comparing these to the climate change people. They had this in Egypt. They had this on the Mount Sinai, Egypt, okay? They're over there. These people don't, fear God and the God of the Bible. And these people have a lot of power, ladies and gentlemen, for, on the earth, okay? We, we, the church, the body of Christ, we have a lot of power with God in the, in the supernatural and the spiritual realms. We can, 
we can change the climate <laughs> easier than these climate change people can. Believe me, God, when we get to heaven someday, we're going to realize we're, we're, we're going to be stunned and shocked at probably how much power that we didn't know we had through prayer. Just to let you know, like it's, but these, these Egyptians, they had a goddess of the sky called Nut, N-U-T. They're nuts, all right. So what did God do to rebuke that one? He sent hail down that rained in the form of fire. The Egyptian god of storms and disorder, this was Seth. This was the, the next Egyptian god. So what did God re do to rebuke that one? He sent a storm of locusts from the sky. Do you think God's going to rebuke these people for their Ten Climate Commandments if he did this to the Egyptians? I would say the odds are pretty high in favor of that. In fact, I think they're going to get all of their rebuke during the seven-year tribulation. But believe me, these climate change people are just getting warmed up. They're not going to stop, and God's getting warmed up too to judge them, all right? I'm saying that with a slight smirk on my face. I shouldn't because they're not going to enjoy it when it happens. But, you know, I mean, I absolutely detest these false gods. I, I absolutely detest them. I, I hate this religion of climate change, you know, and because it sends people to hell for one thing and it, and it makes people go nuts. I mean, it really does, to be honest with you. And look, we have to be responsible stewards of the earth. You know, Adam and Eve were supposed to tend the garden and they're supposed to be responsible. There's nothing wrong with being responsible. The problem is, first of all, they create this narrative which is caused by sin that causes the earth to groan in pain, which causes tornadoes, it causes hurricanes, it causes temperature changes, it causes all kinds of earthquakes, Matthew chapter 24. Sin is what causes it. And then, you know, but these people are motivated by greed and power and money. So this is their real agenda because they want to control you. Okay, this is the real, real issue of why they're doing all of this. They want to control you. And God is going to say, okay, you want to control people. I'm going to give you somebody who's going to control you. And this is going to be the son of perdition. And you know, they're going to be very happy to receive him because they're going to be under a strong delusion that God says he's going to send them in the book of Thessalonians. They're going to go under God's strong delusion and they're going to go, oh, we love you so much. Let's hear, we're going to give you all of our authority in one hour. They're going to give all their authority to this son of perdition in one hour. And then guess what? The news is going around their neck because this, this man is going to cause everybody to receive a mark in their hand where they can't buy or sell. And if you don't take his mark, your head's cut off or you're killed. And then... <laughs> If you do take his mark, then you're under the judgment of God. You're, you're, there's no hope for you to go to heaven at all. So that's the crucible that the climate change people are going to have to go through someday. Thank God Christians are not going to be here for that. Pharaoh, the ultimate power of Egypt. This is the very last plague. He considered himself a god. Pharaoh considered himself a god with a small g. All right, but he's not. He's just a human being. I love, I love to tell people who think they're gods, you, you are not. You are made of the dust in the ground. You have a spirit in you and you have a soul in you. And God created that, not you. You can't make one hair on your head dark or, or white um, unless you age. <laughs> All right. But the last plague that God sent on Pharaoh himself was the death of the firstborn. All right. Those are the... So, I see a lot of similarities between the, the climate change agenda and what's motivating them and what the Egyptians were worshiping back then thousands of years ago. Now, uh, here's what I want to do in closing, and then I'm going to finish this off if you guys don't mind. I want to, I want to give people an, uh, an invitation for salvation to be saved. Uh, what does that mean to be saved from what? To be saved from hellfire. Not only to be saved from hellfire, but to have a relationship with the creator of the universe, which is Jesus Christ, the one who came and died for the sins of the world. And, there, and people are like, well, why did, why did he need to come and die for anybody? I don't understand what that means. Because we were born with a sin virus, and God is righteous and holy and perfect, and he requires payment for sin. So 
if you don't believe that and you die in that condition, you will learn on the other side, but it's going to be too late for you. We don't want you to, to go down that road. We don't want you to be lost. We don't want you to, to, to die without Jesus Christ, who is Emmanuel, God with us. He's only one God, ladies and gentlemen, Emmanuel. God came down in the form of a human being, lived a perfect and sinless life, as it says um, in, the book of, uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> all right, chapter 15. He died, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. And all you have to do is to believe that. Then you have to call upon him. You can't just say, well, I'm going to choose to believe. You know, the way I look at salvation, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. But in order to, to, to have a free gift, you actually have to reach out and take the free gift. You know, and it would be nice to say thank you, too. You know, obviously, we live in an entitlement generation where you give somebody something these days. They don't even want to say thank you. They just feel like they're entitled to it, whatever. You know, God will deal with that in your life. So if you're, you know, all I care about is that you take the free gift. If you're ungrateful, then fine. God will deal with you. But let's get you saved first, okay? You have to reach out and take the gift. So that's through, that's through prayer, okay? Through prayer. And you have to call upon the Lord. And you have to say, Lord, I, I want to take this free gift of salvation that you've offered to me. You may or may not know the Bible very well, but you can say, thank you, Lord, I will take that. Or you can just say, Lord, I'll take it. All right, I'll take it. You know, however you want to do it, but take it. Take the free gift of salvation. Listen to this. For people that think you need to work your way to heaven, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 says this. It says, for by grace ye are ye saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of any works lest any man should boast. I don't care if you're going to a Baptist church, a Pentecostal church, um, a, um, a, what do you call it, a charismatic Catholic or Mormon or whatever. Listen, you people out there that are going to this that might be listening to this video tonight that think that you have to do some kind of works or else God's going to send you to hell, you've got it all wrong. You need to read Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and let that sink into your spirit because God did all the work for you. Jesus Christ did all the work for you. Now, do you want to live, do you want to live as sin-free as possible? You absolutely do. Do you, want to, do you want to grieve the Holy Spirit? No, you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit, which is the, 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 the Father and the Son's living inside of you. You don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit of God who's living inside of you. You want to do the best that you can. You want to show your gratitude to God by living a life of integrity and standing up, you know, and sometimes when we have to speak out against evil things like fraudulent elections, you know. Um, listen, that's all a part of God's plan, by the way. If if there was a red wave, I was hoping for a red wave. If, if there was a red wave, you know, then I think uh, the time of Jacob's trouble would probably be dealt a setback. But now Anthony Fauci's probably not going to be indicted. He's not going to be investigated. Um, there's lots of crazy things that the Republicans were planning on investigating. They won't, they won't be able to investigate now. But it's all a part of God's plan, ladies and gentlemen. Just understand that, okay? That you're living in a unique season, that God's plan is moving forward, and you have to trust him about it. I know that it's, it's a drag to live in a country right now with so much injustice, but remember... I have had preachers and Bible teachers remind me of this all the time. We're just pilgrims here. We're just strangers in a strange land that we are, our real home is in heaven. All right. The free gift of salvation. Our sins have separated us from a righteous and holy God, but in his mercy and love towards us, he made a way of escape for all those who seek it. <clears throat> I'm talking to you right here and right now. God has an amazing gift for you, unbeliever. It costs you nothing, but it cost him to shed every drop of his blood that he had that he could purchase it for you. What is it? It's your salvation. Listen to this uh, verse of scripture here. But God commanded his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. The time of Jacob's trouble, ladies and gentlemen, is God's wrath, and there's another one that just tells you we will be spared of that moment. 
Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Uh, for if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, uh, we shall be saved by this, his life. Romans 5, chapter 5, verses 8 and 10. Um. Jordan, I'll read your comment in a minute, brother. Listen, there's a penalty for sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, verse 23. Chapter 6, 23. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. So it doesn't matter which judgment that we go through. Whether It does matter, but what I mean is we will all be judged. The judgment seat of Christ for believers, unbelievers, the great white throne judgment. You do not want to show up at the great white throne judgment. Go to the judgment seat of Christ. Okay. John 3.16, my favorite Bible verse, probably for salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I like to add verse 17 onto that. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but through him they might be saved. I love that one. Okay, if you confess, this is Romans um, uh, 10, 9, and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto, unrighteous, unto righteousness, sorry for, sorry for the glitch. For man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession made unto salvation. You call upon him. This is what you do with your, with your mouth. You literally call upon the Lord, and this is how you're justified. Pray to the Lord Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me. I am now, I now with a repentant heart, receive you as my personal uh, Savior. Okay? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. It is love that constrains us to tell people that they are lost and headed for a hell if they don't know Jesus Christ. Not hate. Hate, hate says nothing. God has made salvation so simple for a six-year-old child to grasp it. God did, uh, did it all for you on Calvary. All you have to do is accept, accept it or reject it. Do you know what Jesus was doing on the cross? He was making a payment for your sin debt, paid in full, and if you're lost, that payment is just sitting there at the foot of Calvary's cross waiting for you to claim it. You know, if someone had a lottery ticket or a Powerball ticket, you know, with millions of dollars just sitting on, you know, on the porch of a 7-Eleven. Salvation is like that. And people are just walking by every day not picking up that winning lottery ticket. You know, except for some. And some are looking at that lottery ticket and they're going, man, there's more to this life than just what I'm living right now. This depression, this um, alcoholism, this drug addiction, these unnatural affections, unnatural thoughts, this life that I've made for myself, it's so bad and destructive and I'd like to change it. You know, one time I saw a homeless person in Los Angeles when I was down there and he was sitting on a bus bench and he had his bags off to the side and he was reading a Bible. And I was like, man, you know, that moved me when I saw that, that this homeless person was reading a Bible, you know, and, uh, the, remember the rich, the rich, ru the ruler and, uh, the rich ruler and Lazarus, you know, Ra Lazarus was poor. He sat at the gates all the time begging for, for something, you know, to help him. And he was sick and he had boils and, <clears throat> you know, this life is temporary, ladies and gentlemen. I watch my parents die. I watch them pass away. You know, the two most important people to me that I had on the, on this planet, more than a girlfriend, um, except for Jesus, right? Those were the two most influential and important people that I had, watching them pass away. And, you know, Paul said that you shouldn't grieve like you have no hope for those who have died in Christ because you will see them again. So salvation is not a waste of time. Um, even if you do it now, if you're a young person or if you're an older person or wherever you're at, 
you need to get this squared away with God immediately. Because this world, as I pointed out, maybe not in, in a Bible teacher's fashion, but I pointed it out tonight the best way that I could by giving you these um, comparisons to the e ancient Egyptians, gods, and these climate change people that are hell-bent on implementing their laws and their restrictions on you. And they're not going to stop. It's recorded in the book of Romans that they turn the lo their love for God over to the creation instead of the creator. And they're not going to stop. They're going to be a part of the seven-year tribulation. And it's coming very soon. I don't know exactly when, but it's coming. And uh, what do we do, Christian? We, we warn people. We do what God has led us to do and, and called us to do, okay? So if you're not sure what to do for God and you're, you're confused about it, then start with this. Start with reading your Bible. Start with some prayer. Start getting faithful and get a routine started with that. And then as soon as you get immersed in the scriptures, you're going to start getting direction from God. I guarantee you. He does for me, okay? I'm going to let you guys go. Let's do a prayer. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you that I was able to get this message done without any glitches. This first time around was not good, but the second time was much better. I pray that anybody that was watching this tonight gets saved. Uh, I pray for the body of Christ to be ready for the rapture of the church. I know that you're going to spare us from the persecution and the wrath that is to come, Lord. I 100% with every fiber of my being know that you're going to rescue us from that moment. And... Um, I thank you for the group, Blood, Bought, and Born Again. I thank you for every other ministry that is uh, out there. There's a. I want to pray for uh, Watchman River Tom on YouTube. He does an amazing job. He makes videos for you every day, warning people to get right with you before the rapture of the church. Um, I pray for his ministry. I pray for Now the End Begins and their ministry to stay strong and faithful to the very end. I pray for my neighbor, Alice Hilburn, down the street, Lord, who's over 80 years old who was a friend of my parents and she uh, she has a lot of chronic joint pain for her age and I pray for comfort for her. I pray for other people in the group, blood bought and born again that have needs and um, all, all for your glory, Lord. I pray for faithfulness for us. Give us strength to be faithful, which is what you've called us to do, whatever our gifts are. And I know that you're, you will show that to your people. We're so grateful to you, Lord. We look forward to your coming very soon and all the glory to you in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you too, Terry. Okay, that's it, guys. Have a good night. And uh, Lord willing, I'll see you again. I might start getting into the book of First and Second Thessalonians before I start the book of Revelation. That's where I'm, my mind is going at the moment. So I could do some other videos with other things, but that's where I'm thinking I'm going to start heading. So take care, guys. Have a good night. God bless you. And I'll see you again soon. Take care.